Okay. Hello and welcome to At Home with Poetry. I'm Gerard Hogan, a librarian at Central Washington University. This program is part of our library's celebration of National Poetry Month. Whether you're joining us via Zoom, Facebook, or telepathy, we hope your electrons are aligning properly so that you can see and hear us. The technology that enables this is truly amazing, though it can be frustrating and challenging. A while after setting up the registration of this program, we decided it was better suited as a Zoom webinar rather than a Zoom meeting, resulting in a different link. So there may be some folks who are just now circling some dark cul-de-sac of the web, unable to find us. For that, I apologize, but rest assured this presentation is being recorded. We'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the main campus of Central Washington University resides is the historic home of the Yakima people, land that was unwillingly surrendered in the Treaty of 1855. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands in the Kittitas Valley, which was a traditional gathering place for trading and sharing among the tribes east of the Cascades. In that same spirit, we come together now to share our interdependence and our appreciation of poetry. To begin our program, we are lucky and truly honored to be featuring Rena Priest, Washington State's newly appointed poet laureate. In fact, her laurels are still very fresh, having been passed to her by the preceding poets laureate at a beautiful ceremony just last Wednesday. Her appearance today is sponsored by Humanities Washington and the Washington State Arts Commission. Rena Priest lives in Bellingham, Washington and is an enrolled member of the Lochtamish Nation. She is a recipient of a Vadon Foundation Fellowship and an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award. She has attended residencies at Hedgebrook, Mineral School and Hawthornden Castle. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues, was published by Moonpath Press and received an American Book Award. Her second collection, Sublime Subliminal, is available from Floating, press, Floating Bridge Press. Her poems have been featured on Poets.org, in Poetry Northwest, Pontoon Poetry, and elsewhere. Rena has also published nonfiction pieces in High Country News, Yes Magazine, Seattle Met, Adventures Northwest and Nautilus. She is a National Geographic Explorer and was a 2019 particip participant of the Jack Straw Writers Program. She holds a Master of Fine Arts degree from Sarah Lawrence College. Please welcome Rena Priest, a busy and very accomplished poet. Hi everyone. I'm so, so happy to be joining you today. Um, as it was mentioned, the Poet Laureate Program is a joint effort of, uh, sponsored by Humanities Washington and the Washington State Arts Commission, and it is supported by the Washington State Leg Legislature, and I am appointed by the governor. So just wanted to put that, to start all that off, <laughs> um, acknowledging the sponsorship of the program, and um, just jump right in to this reading here. So I have mostly new work, unpublished work to share with you today on the theme of home. Uh, this first poem, it has a place name. Um, and I don't know if you tune, if many in the audience tuned into the passing of the laurels, but these poems um, were shared there, these first two poems. And then um, I have others for you as well. But this first poem includes the place name of Tamquixin, which is Gooseberry Point, um, which is just at the bottom of the hill from where I grew up. Remembering Tata at Tamquixin, and Tata is the affectionate word for mother in the Chlimichasin, in my tribal language. A glossary of bell-related words chimes, sings, peals, tolls. It is a feeling of silver. It rings and shines at the edges. Like the scales of a fish, it flickers. Tintinabulates the signal of a charm, of, of magic, of a movie memory sequence. And then there is mother, home from the cannery, covered in the scales of hundreds of gutted fish. She shimmers like a mermaid. Long day, I ask. When I lunch at noon, she replies, the sky is a polished silver spoon. 
By quitting time, tarnish has overtaken all signs of shine. That's how long the day is. You must have cleaned a lot of fish, I say. I think we cleaned out all of Puget Sound. There used to be gooseberries at Gooseberry Point. Now there's the cannery, won't be long before all the fish are gone. Then the cannery will go and all will have is hunger and sorrow. A burdon is the heaviest bell of a carillon. Its register is low. I wish I had a magic wand to chime the cheerful sound of gooseberries sprouting up out of the ground. So um, these poems, these first two poems are rooted in the theme of solastalgia, which is um, a term coined by an Austrian philosopher. And it's, it talks about a feeling of um, sadness or anxiety or grief over a changing landscape that has uh, disappeared the feeling of home for, for people who live there. Um, this second poem is called A Naming Ceremony. What has grown out of what has gone away? The clear-cut patch has grown larger on the mountain. The rivers have grown murky with timber trash and there's enough runoff cow manure to grow corn out there on the tide flats. I don't want to think about what has gone away. I want to play and meander and forget myself until I can grow a new me in place of all this grief. Learn the language to see the cottonwood as quayalich each, the dancing tree. The killer whales as Quilhalmichton, our relatives under the sea, the whole glorious landscape filled with meaning to end my grieving. When I was young, I was invited to learn Quilnuchkin, the people's language, but I said no, I didn't understand. I thought I wanted to learn to be rich. I didn't know that the only way to possess all the wealth of the world is by naming it. Here is bird song. Here is the kiss of a lover. Here is the feel of cold water at the peak of summer. I have spent my life with words, trying to name a hint of what I lost by not learning my language. Estetemsen, tutatistsen, estetemsen. So I don't know if you've ever experienced um, being far away and for a long time and not hearing your language spoken for a long time. And then if you hear someone speaking English, it sounds like home, it sounds like a familiar voice and it, it, it's very comforting. And um, there's a Stalo Nation author, she's from Tsleil-Waututh um, up in Canada. Her name is Lee Maracle. And I listened to a talk she gave once and she said that um, our mother tongue is inside of it's inside of our DNA and um, it's how we understand ourselves. It's how we speak to ourselves. And I just thought that was incredibly beautiful. And in learning my tribal language, I feel like it is kind of a return to home. It's it's a different way of understanding my home. Um, and I recognize it better, I think. It's very satisfying and fulfilling. And so there's something about that that voice, right? Um, so here's a humorous one, maybe, maybe it's humorous about, <laughs> about that voice, the voice of the beloved. A woman was jailed in the Netherlands for calling a man 65,000 times in a year, an average of 180 times a day, which is seven times an hour. They found eight cell phones in her home with only his number therein. They let her out on bail, but as soon as she was free, she started calling him again. What was in her head? What important thing did she need to say? Was she trying to drive him insane, as insane as he had driven her? Or did she merely need the sound of his voice to touch the tiny bones of her ears, the cadence and timbre of his hello, a return to the vanished home? So I guess it's kind of sad too, but kind of funny. It's based on a, a little article clip that I read <laughs> ages ago, and I thought that needs to be a poem someday. So there it is. Um, this one is called Remembering Sila at Schwilisen, and Sila is our word for grandmother, and Schwilisen is uh, another place name 
it's a very special place to us on the Lummi Reservation. Um, and we harvest oysters there and shellfish, other shellfish. We used to say when the tide is out, the table is set, the earth provided, and if one day it didn't, the spirit fed us. The glittering turn of the tide, the arc of the sun in the sky, the call of birds, the sound of waves, to be nourished in this way, makes glass doors opening and closing themselves between me and that food on grocery store shelves seem false, empty. That food, where does it come from? Whose hands grew it? Was there patience and care? Were there prayers? Think of how it got there, what it's made of. When I was a girl, everything we ate came from the earth that loved us through the hands of people we loved. So um, now I have some brand, brand new poems to share with you. So new, I haven't even printed them yet. See. This next one is called Rolling Uphill. They say somewhere in Washington there's a road where if you put your car in neutral, you'll defy gravity and roll uphill. The scarcity principle says lack breeds lack, that if you have nothing, you'll be sure to attract nothing. Maybe there are places in the mind where you can park your scarcity thoughts and they'll roll uphill into gratitude and abundance. Just kidding. I didn't mean to suggest that this place was only possible. It definitely exists. Let me draw you a map. First, you go past the noise until you reach the silent dancer in the center. Turn with her at each corner until you are the dancer. When the song reverberates in every cell of your body, you've arrived. Park, put it in neutral, and ascend. So this last poem, I will just, I'll read, and then I have something to share with you from Madness, Rack, and Honey, which is um, this poem by Mary Ruf, or this book by Mary Rufel, um, which has inspired this poem and others. Um, this is called The Long Game. We are in a long, long game of peekaboo with the moon. Now you see me, now you don't, and here I am again, and now I'm gone. The game will go on for exactly as long as poets delight in it. And so uh, I'll just read this little blip here about home from the book. <clears throat> from the chapter Poetry in the Moon. Between 1969 and 1972, six missions left for the moon and six missions came back. Not everyone who reads poetry is changed by the experience. Nor were all the men who went to the moon forever altered by their vacation. But those who were, without exception, all say the same thing. It was not being on the moon that profoundly affected them as much as it was looking at the earth from the vantage point of the moon. The earth became the other, you, there, me, here. Alan Shepard, Apollo 14, said, I remember being struck by, I remember being struck by the fact that it looks so peaceful from that distance, but remembering on the other hand, all the com confrontation going on all over that planet and feeling a little sad that people on planet earth couldn't see that same sight because obviously all the military and political differences become so insignificant seeing it from that distance. And then one last quote, which, you know, we all know that when they landed on the moon. The first words were one small step for mankind. But then what we don't know is that when Buzz Aldrin joined Armstrong on the surface of the moon, his words, his first words were beautiful, beautiful, magnificent desolation. And actually I have one more poem to share with you. Um, kind of on that note. Um, 
Let me open it here. Apologies, I hadn't planned on reading this poem, but that quote just kind of got me. Here we go. This one I wrote in response to Jordan Imani Keith's um, call for poetry from women responding to um, what it means to be in an urban environment and relating to what orcas experience in the Salish Sea right now, our Southern resident killer whales. It's called Silence from the Deep and it's a pantoum. How do we mistake desolation for peace? These daughters stolen, these daughters starved, waves say hushed along the beach. Under the waves there is no reprieve. These daughters stolen, these daughters starved. The, matro the matriline dwindles as girls go missing. Under the waves there is no reprieve. From human noise, pollution, hunger, the matriline dwindles as girls go missing. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away from human noise, pollution, hunger. Everything is endangered or going extinct. The world is a mirror of our hearts. Look away. So as not to see how under the waves, everything is endangered or going extinct. When orcas no longer sing, will we see? Will we see how under the waves, the waves that say hush along the beach, when orcas no longer sing, will we see? how we mistook desolation for peace. And that is um, what I will leave you with for now. And uh, we'll move on to the next bit of the program. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Rena. Uh, it seems I've lost the ability to have my video viewing, but I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, now, in addition to your calling as a poet, you will also have the challenging mission to build awareness and appreciation of poetry throughout the state. Would you care to briefly share some of your thoughts about your vision and plans for your term as Poet Laureate? Yes, definitely. So um, one of the things that I would like to do is um, put well, you know how when you um, visit a park or a beautiful place, there's always a placard there and it'll have information about the flora and the fauna and maybe some local history. I would like to see poetry um, included in that. So, because, you know, it could just add this beautiful layer of understanding of the place that you're in, um, especially if viewed through a poet who, who cherishes and treasures that place or who has like a deep history with it, then, um, you know, visitors can also have that experience of the place and, and hopefully treasure it a little bit more um, and even on another whole level. Um, so that's one thing. And then I would also like to do a, an anthology of salmon poetry. Um, because salmon are just so amazing, right? They're a keystone species in the Salish Sea bioregion. And um, I attended a meeting with the volunteers of the um, Endangered Species Coalition. And there was another speaker there and I wish I could remember his name. Um, he asked someone in another meeting, what exactly is the Salish Sea bioregion? How do you define it? And um, the response was the Salish Sea bioregion is everywhere that a salmon can reach. And historically salmon, I'm told, reached all the way to Montana and the best salmon, according to Vine Deloria Jr. Um, in his book, Indians of the Pacific Northwest were in Yakima. Um, people from all over the region really loved and coveted the, those fish and traded widely for them. Um, and also Spokane had a very, very rich um, economy based around salmon prior to white arrival. And then also um, after people um, settled in Spokane, one of the main draws was um, the salmon fishery for tourism prior to the dams being put up. So 
Salmon are a huge part of our state's history and um, well-being and I feel like the loss of the species is something that doesn't necessarily get enough attention. We focus a lot on um, the endangered southern resident killer whales but the reason that they're so imperiled, one of the primary reasons they're so imperiled is that um, they don't have access to their food source, their traditional food source. Um, so I think a salmon anthology would be really a beautiful way to celebrate the, the journey of the salmon, the heroic journey, <clears throat> which really, you know, they, they go out into the ocean, they collect all those marine derived nutrients, and then they swim up these rivers thousands of miles sometimes to deliver those nutrients and to complete their cycle of life and everything benefits, the people benefit, the, um, the trees and the plants benefit and the, the insects and the birds, every, all the other animals benefit from that. And um, I think we, I would like to acknowledge that through poetry. Um, and then the, the third thing that I would really like to do is visit tribal communities throughout our state. Um, I think that it would be a really, it would be just a really beautiful experience for me personally to be able to um, celebrate poetry in tribal communities through my term. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Rena. Haishka. Haishka. Thank you so much. We look forward to all that your, your voice, your spirit, and your presence will bring to the people of Washington State during your term. So thanks again. Thank you. Now on to more poets. I'll hand over the virtual microphone to my co-hosts, Gabby Triana and Marie Marchand. Gabby Triana is a senior at CWU and will be graduating with an English language and literature degree this spring. She writes in creative nonfiction and other hybrid genres, but is a poet at heart. Marie Marchand has been a poet ever since she first heard John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale 30 years ago. She is the Associate Director of CW Gear Up and a student in the Masters in Professional and Creative Writing program. Gabby and Marie. Thank you, Gerard, and hello, everyone. What an honor to have the Washington State Poet Laureate with us today, offering such beautiful poems. Thank you, Rena. And it's an honor to welcome six more fantastic poets who Gabby and I will be introducing momentarily. First, we'd like to debut a collaborative poem entitled, A Place Without Four Walls. It's similar to a contrapuntal, which is a poetic form that contains three poems. So Gabby's poem is in one column, mine's in the other, and then the third poem is a dialectic that's read across the page, and that's what we'll be reading today. So we hope you enjoy it. A Place Without Four Walls. When I think of home, I think of my father, his Brooklyn cop voice booming over whispers of our family, stashing my words in a jar was how I learned to count. When I think of home, I think of mama making sweet potato pie in a toaster oven. The summer we had no kitchen. I left home two weeks after graduation, waved goodbye to secondhand smoke, corn on the cob brittle as bone. When did you leave? I left home the summer after I graduated, craned my neck to watch the house that belonged to my grandparents and then my parents growing smaller as we drove away. I wandered uprooted, peeking into people's lives, wondering, is this my real family, my true home? I lost my sense of home for a while, wondered where I would find it again. Where did you find a new home? I galloped through Larkspur and Firewood Sage wind anointed me. This is home. I think of when I floated in rivers and sunlight. Alaskan waters held my body in summer. I haven't returned in years, but this is home. The turquoise river eddy 
wedged my grief in deep rock beds, and I emerged bathed in light. This is home. I found myself in marginalia in the words of others until I discovered how to speak my own language. This is home. I made a room of my own, painted walls with poetry, journaled the open page waiting. I hid for years, but poetry found me crouched in the corner and it built me a sanctuary. This refuge of language leads us to a garden of awakening where words fall away and in the emptiness we rest. Poetry reaches its hands into my brain and pulls the creeping thistle and marigolds I never knew I planted there. Is this my true home? What if true home isn't one place on one plane? What if home is the poems I carry with me like a scar, a wound now healed? As close as skin or breath. What if home is? Unbounded by time. What if home is a place without four walls? I want home to be where I find curiosity. Where the stream of chaos calms and there is room to speak. I want to live both in words and white space. Poetry is a passageway to a deeper truth. Poetry is an embrace always holding me. An invitation to come home. Thank you. And it was an awesome process working with you, Gabby. <laughs> yes, I had a blast. It was fun. All right, so now I am pleased to introduce Joseph Powell. Joseph taught in Central's English department for 30 years and is now an emeritus professor and gardener who lives in Ellensburg. He's published seven books of poetry and was born without superpowers, though I highly doubt that. Welcome, Joseph. I'm trying to unmute this. You are unmuted. We can hear you, but maybe we can't see you. I can ask the tech person to unmute your camera. And maybe in the meantime, we could move on to our next speaker. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. I'll be introducing our speaker who is Jen Lin. She graduated from CWU in March with a teaching and English language arts degree with a creative writing certificate. She lives in Yakima surrounded by sagebrush and Honeycrisp trees. Her superpower? nonchalantly preventing catastrophic collisions while seamlessly continuing a conversation. Let's welcome Jen. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Gabby and Marie, that was that was wonderful. And a lot of my poem is, is very much the same contemplations of not understanding really what home is, really grappling with that idea and, and that it isn't a room within a walls. And, and Rena, thank you so much for being with us. Um, also, your ideas on, on language being a part of home uh, really resonated with me as well. Um, so I'm, I am going to read my poem. Um, it is called Home, as I didn't have, have a better name for it. And it's also with a line for James Wright. No, this is no lasting city. This hill among empty tombs and honey, cigarettes and ash practiced sacrificial offerings learn to dig through the rubble where the dog was found dead, bones protruding through the basement floor after a burial behind the barbed wire fence. Imagine homesickness is Demetrius and Hermia dancing in a forest, golden coins hanging from rafters, a chicken hawk floating over a hammock, erasing the diesel fumes. Hold this silence in the room beneath the river for all the ancestors who bequeathed hand-stitched costumes, remnants of a corium, remember. This ocean that separates mind from temple, flames deciphered by stone from altars in current of wind, 
breathe. This city above clouds where starlings no longer trapped in cages, carcasses no longer stacked beside sun-baked apples. Um, thank you, that's a little piece of Yakima, a little piece of Washington, a little piece of poetry, kind of all, all mixed in there. Um, but a poem I'd also like to share is, um, I, I think from someone else who really grappled with home, someone who, whose family immigrated um, to, to the United States. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with Lee Young Lee. I'd like to read a poem from, from his book, The City in Which I Love You. Grappling with some of the same questions that, that we all have with home. And it's called With Ruins. Choose a quiet place, a ruins, a house, no more a house, under whose stone archway I stood one day to duck the rain. The roofless floor, vertical studs, eight wood columns supporting nothing. Two staircases careening to nowhere, all make it seem a sketch, notes to a house, a three-dimensional grid negotiating absences, an idea receding into indefinite rain, or else the idea emerging skeletal against the hammered sky, a human thing, scoured, seen clean, from here to an iron heaven, a place where things were said and done, there you can remember what you need to remember. Melancholy is useful, bring yours. There are no neighbors to wonder who you are, what you might be doing, walking there, stopping now and then, to touch a crumbling brick or stand in a doorway framed by the day. No one has to know you. Think of another doorway that framed the rain or news of war, depending on which way you faced. You think of sea roads and earth roads you traveled once and always in the same direction, away. You think of a woman, a favorite dress, your father's breast, the last time you saw him, his breath, brief, the leaf, you've torn from a vine and which you hold now to your cheek like a train ticket or a piece of cloth, a little hand or a blade. It all depends on the course of your memory. It's a place for those who own no place to correspond to ruins in the soul. It's mine, it's all yours. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for choosing that powerful poem and for your lovely poem. I always look forward to hearing what you have to share at the Yakima Coffee House Poets Open Mic night. So thanks for being with us. And Joseph, welcome. We'd love I to think... hear your poetry. Okay. Am I visible now? Yes, we can see and okay. hear you. Okay, great. I, I'll, I want to start with uh, my poem, and it's called Home for Thanksgiving. And uh, I'll just read it. It says, Welcome home, Jesus, my dad said, because of my long hair and beard. I had just sat down when my mother asked me to get a dish from the garage refrigerator, then followed me out. She was upset that I had brought the devil home from college, afraid my doubts like a virus would infect the other children that they might turn away from their catechisms, rosaries, the church itself and its burning history. She raised her voice, her finger, me, and we stood in the quiet aftermath beside the barrel of dog food, the batteries, the sack of duck decoys. Holding the Pyrex dish of raspberries and jello, I asked if it occurred to her that it was harder to doubt to see the angels as wingless God's breath dissolved like a puff of smoke. That meaninglessness was like lead shoes. She told me to keep all that to myself, go to church and at least pretend. The children were so impressionable. She blamed the university for those scales already growing up my hands, horns budding through my hairline. She was near tears, her face as fixed as Abraham's, leading Isaac up to Mount Moriah to the rock altar. When her knife finger lowered, she rushed back to the kitchen. I admired the surety of her belief in the unseen world. 
how the impossible could smile as serenely as an icon. That reverence had a daily place to go and she went. That for her, sanctity was without blemish or illicit uses. Also how gamely she fought the threats to the pieties and security of her brood. I wondered too about the power of my doubts, how declining mass seemed like a shotgun blast to a pool of fish. For her, my thankless, unworthy mind was the universities, that devil's lair, that haven of Vietnam protest. I walked to the raspberry jello back into dinner, and my dad said, Jesus, what took you so long? My parents were in the same place for 65 years, and so I have a very uh, positive uh, uh, experience of home, whereas I think other people might not. And Philip Larkin, I think, also had the same kind of uh, longevity to his house. And so um, his poem, and I think this corresponds to Rena's, I think it was uh, Soul Nostalgia. Was that the neologism? I, uh, so I, had, I think it's right on that notion. His little poem is called Home is So Sad, and it's from his collected poems. Home is so sad, it stays as it was left, shaped to the comfort of the last to go, as if to win them back. Instead, bereft of anyone to please, it withers so, having no heart to put aside the theft and turn again to what it started as, a joyous shot of how things ought to be, long fallen wide. You can see how it was. Look at the pictures in the cutlery, the music in the piano stool, that vase. I think the details of our houses are so powerful and they become kind of talismanic over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Joseph. <laughs> Wonderful to have you with us. Our next poet is Adrija Fasu. Adrija is Associate Director of Annual Giving at Central's Advancement Office. She's a philanthropist, mother, wife, dancer, and aspiring poet. She has no superpower. She's adaptable. Her belief, you are not defined by boundaries, you are defined by space you create. Welcome, Adrija. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a two-part poem based on my journey um, coming home to my family, uh, titled Mother's Homecoming. Um, starting with postpartum that unknowingly brought, home, brought me home, um, I tried to mend the broken vase all the shattered pieces I preserved. I tried to mend the broken vase, all the shattered pieces I preserved, glued one by one with a lot of grace, but the end piece was not the same. Still, I loved it in a broken way, though it wasn't my fine china. With some regret while moving, I let it go. With the missing piece always in my heart, on my shelf, that blank space is the story of this broken vase that was once loved and couldn't be preserved. Is the story of this broken vase that was once loved and it couldn't be preserved. Next comes growth inspired on the day the Capitol was stormed on January 6th. This was a result of my reaction um, the day of the insurrection and challenged by what to teach at home. Growth. Hold your child a little longer tonight as the anxiety hurts you inside. Be thankful that you get to learn. Be hopeful that you get to teach. What happened to you in your home today? You, you preach. The mind weakens, produces water, delivers tears. Wipe away that fear, the body suits itself. The essential source of life is here. Hence, the body reminds the mind, 
survive. Give those you nurture perspective of love, kindness, and empathy. Survive. Rid yourself of claiming a boundary. Survive as there are no two sides to humanity. Thank you, everyone. And I would like to um, read uh, Khalil Gibran, uh, who was an immigrant like myself um, and a Lebanese American writer. Um, his poetry, The Prophet, was published in 1923 in the United States, where he got the opportunity after um, traveling. And his, his honorable work still lives in New York City, in Boston, and um, many areas of the world. So Khalil Gibran on houses. But you, children of space, you restless and rest, you shall not be trapped nor tamed. Your house shall not be an anchor, but a mast. It shall not be a glistening film that covers a wound, but an eyelid that guards the eye. You shall not fold your wings that you may pass through doors, nor bend your heads they strike out not against the ceiling, nor fear to breathe lest walls should crack and fall down. You shall not dwell in tombs made by the dead and for the living, and though of magnificence and splendor, your house shall not secret nor shelter your longing. For that which is boundless in you abides in the mansion of the sky, whose door in the, is the morning mist and whose windows are the songs and silences of the night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Adrija, for reading all of those lovely poems. Next up, we have Emily Page Wilson, who is the Alumni Relations Coordinator for the College of Business. She's published two poetry chapbooks and has a full-length collection forthcoming spring 2022. She isn't sure yet what her superpower is, but has a feeling it's hidden in a Fleetwood Mac song. Let's give a warm welcome to Emily. Thank you, Gabby. I want to take a moment to thank you and Marie and Gerard for all of the hard work y'all put in behind the scenes to facilitate and host this event. Um, I want to thank all of my fellow poets, especially Rena. It has been such a treat. Um, and thank you to all of y'all who are hanging out with us to hear some poetry on your lunch hour. I appreciate everybody um, who's tuning in. The first poem that I'm going to share, I feel like I cheated on this assignment. I shared this earlier. Um, my first chapbook is entitled, I'll Build Us a Home. So I'm going to read the opening piece, which is also entitled, I'll Build Us a Home. I'll build us a home of banded amethyst, basil, and bird cages. You'll sleep beneath the sink where we'll keep soap and baby teeth. We'll worship the purple morning glories and pretend we planted them outside the window on purpose. We'll learn to read left-handed. The trees will apologize for never coming in and blame it on their roots. We'll understand. Our health will be consistent. No sickness, save the ache when August scatters the cardinals. We'll spend so much time together will grow to only speak of silver. The moon, the moss, the bath water will both forget to drain. And then the second poem that I'm going to share, um, it's one of my, it's from one of my favorite collections. This is the tribute course by Brandon Psalm. It came out in 2014 and it explores his Chinese American heritage, the story of his grandfather's immigration, and also language theory, which I think is something that both um, Rena and Jen have mentioned today, how language and home are often really heavily associated. So this collection's first poem is entitled Elegy. My grandfather's grave in scorched grass has two names in the gravestone's granite, one with strokes, silent and once forbidden, the other lettered, a stowaway vow between one aspirate, one liquid. Speech wears the written in the speaker's absence to stay the sound and breath passing. I read that the wood, 
for Thoreau was Resonator Sundays when towns tolled bells. Lincoln, Afton, Bedford, or Concord. Pines with resin reverbed in sap wet wind scent. A Chinese immigrant on his Pacific crossing carried poaching papers for the memorizing. Approaching the island station, these pages were tossed to sea. A moon's light in a ship's wake might make a similar paper trail. My grandfather, aboard at 12, practiced a paper name. What ensued was a debt of sound. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Emily. And I look forward to reading your chapbook next year. Our next poet is Diego Garcia. Diego was born and raised in Quincy, Washington and works as a gear up site director at Quincy High School. His superpower is the ability to create climates with his mind so he can grow whatever he wants to in his garden. Welcome, Diego. Vasco Mati Marie, Piali no Chime, Nano Toca, Diego Garcia, Miawa, Quincy, Washington. Um, so I'm learning Nahuatl right now and I'm trying to implement that as much as I can into my language so I can keep that language alive. Um, so I'll, um, this poem that I'm about to read is titled Land Back. Um, I have a huge focus on decolonization um, in my writings um, around a bunch of, or along with of other, sorry, along with a bunch of other things. Um, so I hope you all enjoy this. I just wanna dedicate this poem to um, all of those who are feeling a little oppressed out there and then also simultaneously my oppressor um, to let them know that what's up, you know, I'm out here. All right, here we go. All right, land back, land back, land back, land back. Give the Indian their land back. This ain't no mythical poem about the great smells of food emerging from one's home like a Looney Tunes cartoon. This is a poem in which the person telling this should not exist had it not been for some luck and lack of will. I live in a land confined by borders that were created through genocide and made for sovereign or made and made sovereign um, for slavers who commodified Natlali wa Namasewalme. Named after an Italian colonizer in the name of God, claimed by a rapist in search of lands to pillage, may God shed his grace on thee, America the beautiful. Land back, land back, land back. Give the Indian their land back. This pandemic has brought back the trauma of my ancestors when over 90% of my peoples died because of a disease that was foreign to these lands and our bodies. And to think that wasn't even the worst disease you brought over here. Your capitalistic appetites are like black holes, a vacuum of total darkness in which the only outcome is complete annihilation. You have separated our families since you have been here and you want us to believe that this is some policy driven by the left or the right. This is how you got the very land for the home that you speak of. You call us savages for our ceremonial sacrifices, yet you come straight for our hearts with your sword and take our children, then demand an entire nation in return. Land back, land back, land back. Give the Indian their land back. You have uprooted me from my native soil and brought me over here so that I could produce for you a product to use and consume. Pressure creates diamonds, said the colonizer, and it also kills souls, said from the voices of the unheard. You ain't the one who took the whip to the back while breathing in the raw metals you are now using to talk on your phone. You ain't the one who is being exploited for leisure. You just profit off it, using the systems and institutions made for you as they oppress me. Call that generational wealth. Land back, land back, land back. Give the Indian their land back. I wish I could tell you about the salmon the size of humans that used to spawn all throughout the Northwest that somehow my Salish brothers and sisters caught without modern techniques, but damn. I wish I could tell you about Denokchitlan and how my Mexica ancestors saw a lake and created self-sustaining floating gardens to feed hundreds of thousands of Masawalme, but borders. I wish I could speak this poem in Nahuatl when I, because when I look in the mirror every morning, I see a Mashika poet with Natlikoli, Juan Ama, sitting upon a pyramid that looks over a vast jungle, staring at El Wicat Citlalo, hoping that I can simply be a recognizable ancestor when the time comes for me to rejoin them again. I wish I could tell you how your new world ain't so new, but I haven't read that book yet. So until then, 
land back, land back, land back. Give the Indian their land back. And then um, lastly, I wanna read a poem from um, Dr. Seema Yasmin, and it's from uh, her book called, um, If God is a Virus. Um, and so, what else is contagious? Ellen's long tongue, a rumor we buried a rumor we buried daddy in an unmarked grave. History, pathogens crisscrossing auger plated petri dishes like rebel soldiers breaching trenches. This story that we had it coming, that we are only good for uncivil wars and diseases, that we prayed for colonization, blood, microbes escaping test tubes, conquering lab countertops, slowering, slower than hearsay. She say we burn daddy's corpse like bad Muslims, like white coated doctors instructed. What else is contagious? Doctor death certificates, half truths, cursive, ink. They say there is no cure, then there, or they say there is no cure, then there is a cure for only them. So what else spreads? Knots of grief, twisting bowels into distended loops of fermenting torment, no days of mourning, two years out, two years of outside intervention, armies, conviction, belief that this will spread and spread, that all contagions wax endemic. This one will never. And that's all I got. Thank you so much, Diego, for that powerful poem. And I just want to say thank you again to all of the poets who are here today. It's so amazing to be with you here in this kind of weird virtual space. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Oliver Beck, who is a senior at CWU focusing on creative writing and accessibility studies. Their pen, their, sorry, pen name is Lay Smith, and their work seeks to investigate the taboo. You will find their superpower in the words they read today. Hey, everybody. Um, okay, so the poem I am reading today, um, I took a very literal interpretation of our uh, prompt and searched for any poem I had that had the word home in it. Um, but, you know, uh, so, so this poem and the poem from another person I'm going to read are really about um, uh, sort of the, the country we're living in, in that home in that sense, um, but also home as identity. Um, so this first poem this is the one I wrote, um, is uh, was inspired by the Pulse Club shooting. Um, and since that shooting, there has been uh, uh, more shootings than I know about in this country. So um, it unfortunately keeps being a difficult poem to read. Um, so this poem is titled The Rainbow Man. He makes his living in glass and pulped flesh, in fingernails steeped in the color of the week. Today is pink and next is fuchsia. He makes his living in strawberry guts and blood orange rinds, fingernails stained in the month of the week. Today is thoughts and prayers and next is history and next is birthday balloons in my coffin and next is remembrance and next is 50 dirt forever beds and next is 50 jelly jars. He makes his living in forget-me-not fields that yield seedless pomegranates and cherry chapstick paste. His fingernails have never touched a whole fruit but found plenty of finger-shaped holes in peeled skins. Oh, he's a rainbow man, and everybody knows what rainbow hands are for, hoe handles and rotten fruit and burning gospels. These rainbow men with fire for tongues, God won't be saving any fallen to that furnace. So he makes his living in hand-bottled bullet homes and forget me before you've met me not. His fruit has never been sweet, born dead, shrapnel salted. He calls them bruise fruit, blood flesh, beaten friend, blessed forgive them not. 
He calls them bullet homes. He calls them one day too late. Ooh, that's always hard to get through. Um, so in that vein, um, I chose to share a poem from the poet Raymond Luxek. Uh, this is his tiny, tiny little um, book uh, titled Mute. Um, he is a deaf and gay uh, writer uh, from, was it Minnesota? Minnesota. Um, and uh, so he writes a lot about um, uh, the 80s and 90s uh, queer scene um, because of Rena's amazing um, readings uh, about language. I wanted to share first a quote uh, from his uh, poem called Later. Um, he says, uh, translate me one more time. I loved how we could rhyme. Death's a cool, cruel interpreter. Nothing translates for later. Um, and then, uh, but the whole poem that I wanted to, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I wanted to mention also, this book is titled Mute, um, but uh, it's important for everybody to know that mute is a slur. Um, and is not something you should call someone who is deaf. Um, and that kind of overshadows the whole tone of this book. Okay. Um, so the, the whole poem I wanted to read is called A Wish Unheard. Once I saw him sitting in his crowded office from a new distance. Coworkers were laughing, giggling almost, beside his huge window. A view of the world grew shimmering through the morning glass. There were the usual skyscrapers, throngs of shoppers, impatient cars. As with anything else, he ceased to notice. It had always been his. He doubled over in laughter, while others tossed in more jokes. He did not have to lip read or ask for a rewind. I wanted to sliver off my ears, forgetting I could catch only so much, and give him my bloodied ears on a satin pillow and say, here, all this is my life. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Oliver, for sharing those powerful lines. Now, uh, Rena mentioned that she'd like us, she'd like to see us use poetry more for to increasing appreciation of the natural world and the threats facing it. I'm going to read A Valley Like This by beloved Northwest poet William Stafford. A Valley Like This. Sometimes, Sometimes you look at an empty valley like this and suddenly the air is filled with snow. That is the way the whole world happened. There was nothing and then, but maybe sometime you will look out and even the mountains are gone. The world become nothing again. What can a person do to help bring back the world? We have to watch it and then look at each other. Together, we hold it close and carefully save it, like a bubble that can disappear if we don't watch out. Please think about this as you go on. Breathe on the world. Hold out your hands to it. When mornings and evenings roll along, watch how they open and close, how they invite you to the long party that your life is. For a little bit of a treat on your way out the virtual door, we'll be pasting into the chat a couple of links. One is a brief and inspiring video featuring some of today's presenters on why they write poetry. The other link is to register for next week's program, Revisiting the Beats, which will celebrate the poetry of Allen Ginsberg and the recently deceased Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I'd like to thank all of our wonderful poets, my co-hosts, Marie and Gabby, 
to the librarians and technicians working in the background, to our appreciative audience, and a special thanks to our special guest, Rena Priest. Thank you all very much. See you out there in the poetry world later. Bye for now.